Hello, good morning everyone. Hello, good morning everyone. Ma'am, you are muted. We can't hear you. Okay, I'll start again. So good morning, everyone. Uh, today we have quite an action-packed day. Uh, what we're gonna do is in the morning, we have this session, which is going to be on the infrared database, which is held at Caltech, okay? So at Caltech, they basically have a database for infrared data. And uh, we have Luisa Rivul, who's actually in charge for the database in Caltech. And she has specially made a video for us uh, on the data archives, which they have at Caltech. And uh, the plan is that in the morning, now we'll have the session where we'll show you all your video. We'll have Q&A today in the morning also. We'll try to answer your questions. But since Luisa is the expert, she's going to log in in the night, but that's going to be 10 o'clock in the night on a Saturday night. I understand that's a little bit of a problem. But that's all I could manage with her because, um, because of the time difference. So um, <clears throat> she's going to be fresh. It will be 9.30 in the morning for her. So we'll have a 10 o'clock session also today other than this 10 o'clock session. So we have night 10 o'clock session with her. And please note that what I've actually done, what we've done is that all the Zoom sessions now, the Saturday, Sunday morning sessions will have the same ID and the same password, which is has 2020. But the night session, which we are going to have, that will have another password and another uh, meeting ID. So please note the meeting ID and the password which we have for the night session. I've shared it on Facebook, I've shared it on Telegram, I've sent it to you by email also. So please note in the night, the session that we have, that has a slightly different, it has a different ID and it has a different password, okay? But our regular Saturday, Sunday sessions are going to have the same ID and the same password. So soon I'm going to uh, wean you all off from sending you all uh, circulars about what is the ID, etc., because that's going to be the same, okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, share the screen and actually show you, um, no, I need a, I need the browser. So what I'm going to do now with you is, I hope you all can see, uh, you all can see my browser, right? Yeah. So today you'll have a good amount of homework. What you basically have to do is you will Google IRSA IPAC. Okay, here's the IPAC. <clears throat> so what Luisa is gonna talk about is basically when you log into this website, okay, this is IRSA IPAC, which is the, uh, the NASA IPAC Infrared Science Archives. And like you can see in these science archives, you have data from various infrared missions. These are not only NASA missions, some of them are ESA missions. For example, Spitzer is an ESA mission. You have uh, Planck, et cetera. These are European space, this thing. But some of them are American. For example, WISE is in American. SOFIA is in American. This one, IRTF, TUMAS, et cetera. All these are this thing. So uh, what you can see is that Luisa herself, since she's been in charge for this website, you can see that there are a whole bunch of video tutorials over here. There is a good amount of documentation, which is nice. Very good. She's taken a lot of effort in actually making these 
documentations, making tutorials and things like this. She also has these video tutorials. And the other option what you can do is you go to the YouTube page. OK, go to the YouTube page. And over here on YouTube, you can again look for IRSA IPAC. It's also linked from that web page, which I was showing you. But this is an easier one. So if you go to IRSA IPAC, right, you can see that um, these are the, um, she has various tutorials over here. This is the one she's made for us, which we are going to play today. She's already put it up on the website. But uh, obviously, everything is not covered in this. So there are a whole many, many uh, tutorials she's put. These are, you know, short ones, nine minutes, 10 minutes, short kind of tutorials, which are, for example, on the SOFIA. The SOFIA is a very interesting telescope. It actually is on an aeroplane. Okay. So in an aeroplane, you take it up, you basically want to uh, go above the atmosphere so that your infrared radiation comes in. So SOFIA is a, is a, is a, it's literally a plane on which you have a telescope and it gets data. So she has playlists based on, for example, SOFIA time series tools, these things and all that. You need to be uh, conscious about this because when you are planning your projects, right, you need to know from where are you going to get your data, what kind of data is available, and what is the kind of things you can do with this data, right? So infrared data is especially very useful for me, for example, since I work on star formation, we use a lot of infrared data and uh, hence it's useful for us, but depending on what kind of objects and what you're trying to look for. So I urge you all to also have a look at her you this YouTube website of theirs, where there are uh, separate videos on WISE, on Spitzer. Uh, a lot of them are on uh, basically data analysis tools, right? What are the data analysis tools available and how can you use them, right? So your work for today, your homework for today is today itself. We are going to play the video. And after that, you are going to um, uh, prepare your questions, which we'll have in the night, right? Uh, I hope you'll all realize that this is a rare opportunity where you're getting a chance to interact with somebody who's, uh, you know, at the helm of these things. Because like I said, this site and all is, is basically maintained all by Louisa only, the person who's going to talk to you all in the night. So now we'll start your video. After the video, we can have some Q&A. Like I said, a certain amount of it we can answer. But uh, otherwise, we will uh, keep the keep questions for the night. So now it will be like a preparatory session like we did with Top Cat. Oh, yeah, I should even tell you all that uh, Mark Taylor was very happy with your response with your question. Angle between two vectors can be 180. One minute, somebody is not muted. I have somebody who's not muted. Please mute him. Hello, I have somebody who's not muted. Hello, I have somebody who's not muted. Please have a look who's not muted. Please mute. So we are going to start with the video and please remember we are going to meet in the night today at 10 o'clock also. Oh, like so I was mentioning to you, Mark Taylor was very happy with the kind of response and the questions you people asked. And therefore, I would be really happy if you see the video intently and go through the, the things which are there on the YouTube or the web page so that you prepare yourself for the session which we are going to have tonight with her at 10 o'clock. Right. So let's start with the video and um, um, let, we'll meet in the night. from our introduction to what astronomical archives are. It is really true that there are more data than professional astronomers can really hope to completely mine, and there's more data coming in literally all the time. So yes, it's true that professional astronomers are going to pull off the easy-to-do science, the low-hanging fruit, but there's plenty of good science still in the archives. And any facility that comes from public funding, at least U.S. government public funding, 
is supposed to have a publicly accessible archive, which means that, you know, since the taxpayers already paid for these data, those data also belong to the taxpayers. NASA is really, really, really good about having lots and lots of public archives that are available not just to U.S. citizens, but from people anywhere on the planet. The National Science Foundation in the U.S. is getting there. Um, Europe is catching up. There's sort of uneven results for other countries. But there's so much data. NASA data alone will keep you busy for a really long time. And when I'm talking about NASA data, NASA has lots of lots and lots of data from, you know, they they do NASA does Earth observing and they do uh, observations of planets, you know, like sending rovers to Mars. And there's NASA astrophysics, which is telescopes looking out past the edge of the solar system. So there's there's lots and lots and lots of NASA data. Um, I'm going to focus on astronomical data because that's what I do. But I wanted to call your attention specifically to all the moon and planetary data that are out there. Um, Emily Lakdawalla is um, a person who works at the Planetary Society, and she is an enormous supporter of these programs that get planetary data into the hands of so-called amateurs. There's some really amazing, amazing, amazing stuff that these these people who are supposedly amateurs are doing because a lot of these planetary data archives, the data are public as soon as they come back from the spacecraft. So the scientists are getting them at the same time as anybody else who goes to the website. And so there's a huge community uh, of people who jump on those data as soon as they arrive. And so they make these absolutely marvelous, marvelous images from the from the planetary data that's coming back. So Emily Lakdawalla has many, many tutorials that cover how to get access to those data and how to work with those data. Because that, that community has different conventions than either the Earth observing folks or the uh, astrophysics folks. So I just wanted to call your attention to that. I'm not going to talk about that anymore today. So I'm going to really focus on the astronomy data. So archives are super valuable. And we have the data now that tells us that for any given um, astronomy mission. If you have a good archive, it can double the amount of science you get from your telescope. So the first plot there is the fraction of papers that are produced using Spitzer data, and the y axis, sorry, the x axis is time. The blue data, the blue wedge, is people who are writing papers about data that they themselves propose to get. The green wedge is papers that are using data that were found in the archive, not, not requested by the people who are writing the paper. And the red wedge is people who are using both PI data and archival data. And you can see, even though this plot stops at 2017, you can see that about half of the papers are using just archival data and have been for quite some time. Um, it's not just Spitzer that is like this. Hubble is the other plot on the lower right, it too has, uh, rather than fraction of papers, now they have total number of papers. And you can see there too that a good chunk of the papers that are produced using Hubble data are using Hubble archival data. So that's the value. If you have a good archive, then you double the amount of science you can do with the telescope. So the archives are, of course, designed for the professional astronomy community. But these archives are usually designed to be easily accessible, and that has to be easily accessible to astronomers of all kinds. Uh, you know, an emeritus professor who can barely read his email all the way through a summer student starting her very first research project. So those archives need to be accessible to all of those people, which means it's available to anybody who knows where the website is. You can get into it and use it without trouble at all. But you do have to reach across the barrier, by which I mean you have to be become familiar with um, conventions and jargon and file formats and um, units, and you, you need to learn about the data that are produced from any given mission. So it's not going to be packaged up for you with a nice little ribbon on top. Um, the images that you see for press releases often have um, some massaging done to them to make them look pretty for press releases. Um, and a lot of stuff that gets removed either when doing science or the next step of doing a press release 
are things like instrumental artifacts, things that aren't really in the sky, but the things that are a result of the telescope's response to light, for example. So um, you have to become familiar with what, you know, what you're going to find in the archive and how to actually look at the, at the data and understand what's going on. So one of the things you need to do is don't use Microsoft Internet Explorer as your default browser. Most astronomers are using Macs or Linux machines, so they're not using Windows. And because these astronomical archives are not swimming in money, they have to limit what they're supporting. And since so few astronomers use Internet Explorer, there's not a lot of effort put towards making these archives compatible with Internet Explorer. So the first thing you want to do is go get Firefox or Chrome. Don't use Internet Explorer uh, to access these archives. So NASA has several different archives. Um, at IPAC, where I work at Caltech, there are four different NASA archives. There's URSA, which I work for, which is the Inf Infrared Science Archive. NED is the NASA Extra Galactic Database, the NASA Exoplanet Archive, and COA, which is the Keck Observatory Archive, um, is all, all four of those are NASA archives based at IPAC. Space Telescope in Baltimore, Maryland has MAST, which is a NASA's home for UV and optical and some IR data. Goddard Space Flight Center in, uh, in Maryland it has uh, HEOSARC, which is the high energy archive, but also the cosmic microwave background um, archive. And then in Boston, Massachusetts, at SAO, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory and the Center for Astrophysics, there's an archive called ADS, the Astrophysics Data System, which is all of the literature in astronomy worldwide from the 1600s through this morning. And it's all accessible, all searchable, really fantastic. And then uh, CFA also has, and SAO also has the Chandra Observatory Archive. So URSA, URSA is the Infrared Science Archive, and our charter is to provide an interface to all of NASA's infrared and submillimeter data sets, which means from about a micron to about a centimeter. It was founded in 1993, and it was the original home to IRAS data. IRAS was a joint British-American um, mission that flew in 1983 and was the first all-sky survey in the infrared. And URSA was founded to be the home, the, the archive for that data. Um, more than 10% of all referee journal articles written today use data that ultimately came from URSA. So we have a lot of useful data in our archive. We have nearly five petabytes of images. So a terabyte, there's a thousand terabytes and a gigabyte, sorry, a thousand gigabytes and a terabyte, a thousand terabytes and a petabyte. So, and we have five petabytes of images and 240 terabytes in databases. We have OSCI coverage in 24 different bands. Many of URSA's tools have a similar look and feel because they're written with the same underlying software and that software is called Firefly. It provides interactive tables and plots and images and overlays so that you can really explore the data that we have at URSA. So I'm gonna give you uh, more of a demonstration in a minute, but I wanted to just show you this quick screenshot because it a lot of the URSA tools are gonna have the same look and feel. So we've got an image in the upper left and all those red boxes are catalog overlaid on the image. On the right-hand side, upper right, we've got the catalog itself. And on the bottom, we've got a plot made from that catalog. And they're all interactive. You can click on a source in the image and see where it is in the plot in the catalog. You can click on a source in the plot and see where it is in the image in the catalog. So some examples of some projects that you could do with URSA tools. Uh, you, uh, you probably have a favorite object. So what is bright and what is faint in images of your favorite object in each one of the wavelengths that is available at URSA? Uh, is it going to be the same things that are bright in each one? We have some optical data and then a lot of infrared data spanning a wide range of wavelengths. So it, get, go get an optical image of your object, go get an infrared, a, a near infrared image, a mid infrared image, and a far infrared image. And is it the same things that are bright in each one? There's a lot of astrophysics buried in that. You could go get a Messier object of each of the broad types of objects that are in the Messier catalog, like Pick a nebula, pick a globular cluster, pick a galaxy, and do that same sort of exploration. What does it look like across the wavelengths? And depending on which Messier object you pick, you may need to request wildly different sizes of images. Um, so 
yeah, so there are some classes of Messier objects that are going to look very different in the infrared, and some are going to look quite similar in the optical and infrared. You can, if you have access to a telescope that you took data from, you can make a three-color image that uses your image as one of the color planes. In order to, to make this work, you actually have to have astrometry in the FITS header, that, uh, the world coordinate system. In other words, you have to have a way to tell the computer how to translate pixel number to position on the sky. And the way that it does that is astrometry. And if your FITS image doesn't have a FITS header with this information, you need to add it. And there's a website called astrometry.net, not astronomy, but astrometry.net, that will allow you to attach coordinates to your FITS image. Also, of course, URSA's YouTube feed has many movies on tools like Finder Chart, which I'll show you in a minute, and all the other tools at URSA. Uh, URSA's YouTube feed is linked from the bottom of the main URSA homepage, or you can type in that long, complicated URL. There are many different playlists at the URSA YouTube feed. You should not treat the playlists as really playlists. In other words, they're not trying to collect um, images or videos that will tell a coherent story if you listen to all of them in order. This is I'm treating the um, playlists at the URSA YouTube feed as sort of tables of contents. So, like all of the um, movies pertaining to Sophia are collected in one playlist and that sort of thing. So this is the URSA homepage. You can find us by Googling, but you may need to convince Google that you're not interested in tax information in the U.S. Go to the URSA homepage, and there's a couple of things right off the bat here. This tool will give you an indication of any data sets we have at URSA that overlap the position that you give it. And this is sort of a broad catch-all net, um, but probably is not the best place to actually start. There are other, the search catalogs here is another interface to the catalog search tool. There's URSA viewer, find your chart, and if you want to write your own code to interact with the archives, you can do so using VO protocols, APIs, application programming interface. Then there are more tools down here that correspond to individual data sets from individual observatories. But for new people, I recommend that you start with Finder Chart because it gives you the same chunk of sky um, in several different wavelengths. So I, I study star formation, so I'm going to put in M16, the Eagle Nebula. So I put in the name, and it figured out what the coordinates are. It tells you below the box what the coordinates are that it, that it thinks you've entered so that you can check and make sure that it's understood you correctly because if you stop typing at M1, it's going to give you a different position than M16. Um, you can use either NED in the NASA Extra Galactic Database or SIMBED to turn the names into coordinates. Next, you want to pick an image size. 300 arc seconds is the default, probably good enough for this. Display size, if you're on a laptop, you might want small, or a big screen, you might want large. Then you can pick what uh, image set you want. So DSS is the Palomar Observatory Sky Survey Digital uh, Sky Survey. So it's digitized sky survey plates from Palomar and another second telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, surveyed not all the sky, but a big chunk of it in the Northern Hemisphere. Two Mass is the Two Micron All Sky Survey. That is all sky. WISE is the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. That is also the whole sky. The Spitzer a Space Telescope was a pointed mission, so it only it doesn't it didn't do the whole sky, but it did a lot of the sky. And there were two main parts to the Spitzer mission. The first part where we had cryogen and all of the instruments were operating, and then the second part where we had run out of cryogen and only the shortest two wavelengths of IRAC were operating. So SEIP is the Spitzer Enhanced Imaging Products, and right now they are just the data taken when we had cryogen on board. It does not yet include the considerable amount of data taken after the cryogen ran out. Akari was a Japanese mission that surveyed the whole sky. They had a couple different instruments on board. Their longest wavelength instrument, FIS, uh, has images that they've released of the whole sky. So you can search on Akari as well. And then IRAS, I mentioned earlier, IRAS is the Infrared Astronomical Satellite. And the specific data set that you're looking at here is IRIS, which is a particular processing of the IRAS data. And that is also the whole sky. But it was the very first all-sky infrared survey. So you will see in a minute just how low the spatial resolution is. So when you're first starting out, I recommend that you turn off the catalogs because it can be overwhelming very quickly. Search.
So it's coming back with the same chunk of sky from all of these surveys. It's the same size and they're all oriented properly. The changes there are coming as it's continuing to load in images. I think it's done loading now. So you can see here that we've got DSS. These two were taken in the 1950s. These were taken in the 1980s. Um, in the late 90s. Now you see the data stop. The two mass tiles are really, really small. So you in finder chart. And then all walk. So there's a wise one, wise two, wise three, and wise four, which is three and a half, four and a half, twelve, and twelve. J, H, and K are one to two microns. And then we've got Spitzer SAIP. So IRAC one and IRAC two are very similar wavelengths to wise one and wise two. So three and a half and four and a half microns. IRAC three is 5.8 microns. IRAC four is eight microns. And MIPS 24 is 24 microns. So you can see it's the same chunk of sky, right? The, the fingers there, there are the talons of the eagle in the Eagle Nebula. And you can see the fingers in the DSS images. They're really not obvious at all in two mass. And they're starting to become more prominent in Wise. And in Spitzer, you can really see them quite obvious. Now we've got Akari. So you can see they're very long wavelengths and the pixels are very big in comparison to the other missions. And then IRAS, the pixels are enormous, right? It's the same chunk of sky, it's all lined up, right? So 60 microns is bright here. It's that same chunk of sky that's bright in a lot of these other books. This is all reverse grayscale. So white is the black sky and black color in these images is bright. So all of these are, you're at, interacting with the actual images. So they're actual FITS images, not JPEGs, not PNGs, not representations of the data, but actual FITS files. And so there's a whole bunch of tools you can use at the top that allow you to interact with the images. So for example, you can zoom in or zoom out or uh, set it so that one pixel on the screen matches one pixel in the image. You can zoom them to fill the image, the box that you have. Um, you can make them large enough to, to, you know, to match the box left, right? So this chunk of, you know, this image here, it's over, it's uh, outlined in orange. That's the current image. So because these are locked together, anything I do to the current image is done to all the other images as well. So if you want to change the color table, you can do that. If you want to change the color stretch, you can do that. You're not actually changing the data. You are just changing the representation of the data. Uh, and depending on what you want to bring out in the image, you might choose a different stretch or a different color table. Um, because this, this tool is called Finder Chart. And so people really do use it at telescopes. And so you can, if your telescope has a particular rotation where north is not up, you can change that. You can put it back north up. And some telescopes uh, flip things. So you can flip uh, on the on the y-axis like this. Um, this asks you, you know, if you're moving the images off and you want to recenter them, it'll center back on the target that you asked for. Um, I'm going to skip the select an area for a second. Um, this is a ruler, so you can measure the distance between things on the image by clicking and dragging. If you, it's given me um, the length in arc seconds there. So there's 88 arc seconds approximately between those two stars. We can change the units on that if you want. Here is the layers icon. So the layers are showing us everything that we have overlaid on the image. So I'm going to select uh, this one. So that's outlined in orange. Now the layers is going to give me all the layers that are overlaid on that selected image. So I've got um, the, the underlying image, the target that I searched on, and then here is the distance tool where I can change the color if I want, or I can tell it I want the position angle Oh, that's interesting. Um, you can uh, measure, you can tell that you can change the units of um, what's displayed. Although that's interesting that it completely killed it. It doesn't usually do that. I... Okay, um, so you can also add markers. If you're planning observations, you can overlay footprints from a variety of different telescopes, or you can just add a regular old marker on the image. Um, you can add a compass rose, you can add a coordinate system. You can read in DS9 regions files. So DS9 is another popular imaging program, and you can create overlays in DS9, and those overlays will also work on the images here. 
Um, you can, there's the layers icon, which I already mentioned. You can also change colors and delete from here. Um, this turns everything back to the defaults. This locks color changes and overlays. This one locks position. Since this is finder chart, all the images you're getting are of the same position. So that's why that's locked. If you want to see more information about each image here, this one I've uh, highlighted in orange and the fits header is there. And this is an interactive table, so you can search it or sort it, do whatever you need to do to find the keywords that you're Okay, so let's go get some catalogs to add in. Let's go back over here. We'll leave it at M16. Um, but now I want to say search the corresponding catalog. So by default, it's assuming you're carrying just about the target in the center where you've asked. But for this example, let's change it to search within the image boundary. So it's going to go the images it already has. Basically, it's just pulling that out of the cache. And now it's going to go get the catalogs too. So I didn't find any IRAS sources in this region. Not surprising because it's a tiny chunk of sky. Um, I don't think it's going to find any Akari sources either, but we'll give it a second. It should find a bunch of Spencer sources, a bunch of Y sources, and a bunch of two mass sources. It won't find any Sloan data because there isn't any Sloan data of M16. So I might as well just close that. So it is loading the images very slowly. There we go. So we've got a two mass image in the background, and then all those green log overlaid on the image. So you can see why I told you to turn it off initially, because it is overwhelming. Um, and the same thing is true for Wise. There's a catalog that's overlaid on the images there. The DSS images from Palomar do not have a catalog that go with them, um, but pretty much everything else does, although it's not yet found one Akari source. There you go, one Akari source right there and no IRS sources in this tiny chunk of sky. Okay, so then the purple boxes there are all Spitzer enhanced imaging products sources. So the plot it's given on the lower right is a, pos a plot by position, which is kind of boring and seems kind of silly given that we have the catalog overlaid on the images here, but that is kind of the idea um, because you've got, got interactive things. So if you wanna see where this source is in the catalog, Oh, it's a two mass. Let's get two mass. Then it will jump to that source in the plot and in the catalog. But you can change what is plotted. You can say, let's see, let's do something slightly easier first. Let's say I only want the things that have really high quality detections. So things where the signal to noise ratio in J is greater than 10, and things where the signal to noise ratio in H is greater than 10, and things where the signal to noise ratio and K are greater than 10. So we've imposed filters, and now we have many fewer sources in the catalog, in the plot, and overlaid on the images. We only have the good detections. We can also change what's plotted as soon as it actually loads. Okay, so let's change what's plotted. You go to the gears, and it's going to come up. Um, first with a plot style question, and then it's going to ask what we want for the X and Y axis. So for the X axis, let's do J minus H. So the columns in the catalog are J underscore M. Now, if you don't remember, I use these catalogs all the time, so I know what the columns are. But if you don't remember, you can click on the uh, magnifying glass and it'll give you a list of all of the columns in the catalog. But we actually want is not just a value, a value from the catalog. We want to do J minus H. And then for the Y axis, we want to do H minus K. Okay. So now we have a color color diagram as soon as it plots it. Now we have a color color diagram of the sources that are high signals and noise in this region. So now if you want to look at, gosh, that's a really, really red source. Let's click on that. There's that source. And here's where it is in the image. Let's see if we can make it bigger. So we're going to look at just one image at a time and zoom in a little bit. Come on. And move that around. So there is that very red source. So you can interactively explore the catalog and the images. If you want to stop all the filters you have imposed, you can click on cancel filters and it will cancel the filters that we've imposed from all of these different places. And it will give you again, the whole catalog um, in the plot and on the image and on the table. Let's go back to multiple images. So you can do that 
You can't yet do that across catalogs. And so if you want to, say, make a plot that combines Ys and 2MAS, you'll have to make your own catalog in URSA table format and load it in to make the plot. Um, it, at the moment, it can only plot things from one of these catalogs. So that's the basic idea. The plots and the images and the, the catalogs are all interlinked. Let's go to Ursa Viewer. So Ursa Viewer is another version of um, the same kind of Firefly tool. But unlike Finder Chart, which gives you a chunk of sky from several different surveys that are all, you know, very, very constrained, this gives you something more unconstrained. So let's, just for kicks, do M16 again. And then instead of 500 arc seconds, let's do 20 arc minutes, okay? Now, the next part is fairly overwhelming because there's just truly an amazing, an amazing number of data sets that are available in here. And rather than trying to read all of them and figure out what they are, you should use these filters on the left. So for example, if you're mostly interested in Y's data, if you click on Y's, it only limits you on the right-hand side now to the stuff that's from Y. So if I click here, I'm going to select all four bands. I can choose just one um, or all of them. Okay, so let's unclick that. So the Ys is still in there and still selected. Let's look at two mass. So remember I said a few minutes ago that the two mass tiles are really tiny. That's because in the late 90s, that's what the computers needed to be able to handle it, is little tiny tiles. And now things are faster. So instead of doing the tiny tiles from all sky, let's do the six degree mosaics because those will be a bigger chunk of sky and it's be much less likely that we'll hit the edge of the tile. So let's unclick that and let's go for Spitzer too. So Spitzer has uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of projects that deliver data. So SEIP, remember, is the Spitzer Enhanced Imaging Products, which includes all of the data taken when we still had cryogen. So if you want data taken from the considerable second half of the mission where it was just the shortest two bands, you want to do research into figuring out which one of these programs you need, or you can start to use the filters here. So I know that M16 is in the galactic plane. So if I click on galactic, now I only have um, the uh, Spitzer programs that are also galactic, and you see it's a much shorter list. So let's do glimpse because I'm pretty sure that M16 is in part of things. Okay, so we've selected a bunch of things. Let's go search. So now it's going to load in, or at least attempt to load in, all the request the images that we requested. So now you can see, even just at a glance, that they're not all the same orientation. Let's change the color table. Let's change it to reverse grayscale. And now let's pick. Uh, let's pick two mass J. So I'm going to click on that. It's outlined in orange. I want to say align and lock by WCS. This happens automatically in Finder Chart because Finder Chart is constrained to be the same chunk of sky. Or as a viewer, you can go back and load as many images as you want from different parts of the sky. So it's not locked by default. The glimpse tiles are generated in galactic coordinates. So that's why they're not, they don't come up by default in the same orientation as the rest of them. So now we've got the same chunk of sky in many different wavelengths. Let's find your chart. One of the nice things about it was that it was ordering the images we got by wavelength. So go up here and choose the table icon. This is an interactive table, just like all the other tables in Firefly. So if you click on wavelength, it sorts the images by wavelength, not just in the table, but in the display as well. So if you want to say, use this to compare what Messier objects look like across many different bands. This is how I would recommend doing it. And then when you sort it by wavelength, it becomes much more obvious that the long wavelength stuff is mostly seeing the interstellar medium and the short wavelength stuff is mostly seeing the stars. Here you can make catalogs and plots as well. Um, you go to the catalogs tab and you have access to a lot of different catalogs. Let's get, um, you pick polygon, you can tell it I want sources over the whole image or subsets thereof. I'm going to go and get the all wise source catalog. Okay, so it's overlaid the catalog on the images, it's made a plot for us, and it's put the catalog over here. So again, it's pretty overwhelming. Let's do some filtering. Let's get this down to just the high quality detection. So greater than 10 signal to noise ratio in Ys1, greater than 10 signal to noise ratio in Ys2. 
greater than 10 signal noise ratio in Ys3, and then greater than 10 signal noise ratio in Ys4. Many, many, many fewer, fewer sources. Let's do one image at a time. There's J. Okay. So now we can change what's plotted too. Here we can actually change. We have more flexibility in, well, we have more flexibility in all of these panes than we did in, in the finder chart. But here we can change what's plotted just like uh, we could before. So J, oh, J minus H. Uh, why is that not working? Oh, because it's a wise catalog. Silly me. W1M Pro minus W4M Pro. And then W1M Pro. Okay. So there we have a color magnitude diagram. But conventionally, you want the bright object at the top. So reverse the y axis, apply. Now we have an infrared color magnitude diagram. Here, too, you can pick the very reddest things and see where they are in the table and in the plot. Come on, you can do it. I don't know why it's not. There we go, it finally worked. Okay, you can also make different kinds of charts. So instead of a scatter plot, maybe I want a histogram of all the Y's one brightnesses. And there it is. Okay, I haven't shown you stuff about the selection yet. So let's cancel the filters. Let's get rid of that plot. Let's go back to doing just the images big. Um, okay, so maybe what we want, let's do one image at a time. So let's say we only want the sources that are in, you can't see her, but my cat is affecting the mouse. Very sorry. Um, you can see that dark region here. So let's go to selection. So if I pick this, okay, it gives me many choices. So one of the things I can do is I can filter down the catalog so that it only includes sources from that region. And we can cancel the filters. Um, we can select an, a portion of the image and do statistics on it. And here, if we put our mouse over it, it will overlay, you can see a tiny red, here, let me turn off the catalog, it'll make it easier to see. Let's turn off the catalog. Okay, so now that little red X that's in the lower right of the box is where the faintest thing in the image is. That's where the brightest thing in the image is. That's where the, the center is of the pixels in the aperture, and this is where the flux-weighted centroid is. So you can do some simple photometry this way, but I don't recommend it in general. If you want to crop the image, you can do that. And then you can, for example, save that cropped image to disk. Let's return everything to the defaults and go back to the default view. Oh, we need to turn the catalogs back up. So the, the selection criteria can do a lot of different things. You can, you know, like I say, crop images, select portions of the sources in the images, and so on. Okay, going back to the main URSA page. Um, so uh, we've covered URSA viewer and find your chart. The catalogs interface is like this one, but it is accessing just catalogs, not the images. So you can um, more easily, I think, access the catalogs from within URSA viewer. But if you want to get into just doing catalog selections on your own, you can use that tool. The other stuff down here is a lot of really good documentation as well as data that aren't yet available in some of these other tools. So the Spitzer data, um, if you go here, find basic information about Spitzer, lots of good things to learn, but then all of the information about all those different projects and what they deliver, this is why half the publications from Spitzer involve archival data, because there are so many contributed products from people who use Spitzer. This is really phenomenal, and it's already reduced. It's already got catalogs, already got spectra. You don't have to do very much besides just get started on your science, but you do need to read all that documentation to figure out what it is that you're looking at. WISE similarly has a page with lots of documentation and lots of information about all the different portions of the mission and then all the different deliveries of data products that they have. Um, Sophia is our newest archive. Sophia. Uh, is a plane with a hole in the side. It takes a lot of infrared spectroscopy. So they do not cover large chunks of sky, 
but you can see this interface is very similar and will allow you to search the SOFIA archive. Um, here, uh, IRTF is another relatively new archive. This one also has an archive that allows you to, to search the, the delivered data that they have provided. Two mass is here. Herschel was a European mission. Uh, again, documentation, all these places. Planck is a very long wavelength mission. Again, lots of documentation and stuff to look at. IRAS, um, it, we've already talked about. MSX is um, actually an Air Force mission. Uh, and they, they surveyed the galactic plane. And so there's a whole bunch of data there. ISO was a European mission. Lots of data from there. SWAS is a submillimeter uh, satellite. ZTF is time series. So they, um, this, their telescope is based at Palomar. So if Palomar can see it, they probably have at least several images of it, if not many, many, many. Kari, we've talked about Cosmos is an extragalactic research project that holds, that has data from huge numbers of wavelengths and all of their data are available through URSA. BLAST is a balloon-borne mission. Uh, so they've got some data here. BOLOCAM is a ground-based millimeter observatory, and, uh, and so there's a, lots of data there. And IRTS is also a relatively old mission with lots of data. So all of these links go to pages that have documentation, explanations, background, access to the data. There's lots and lots of documentation online. There's video tutorials I mentioned earlier that are available here. And then there's the help desk. So if you have questions, you can mail us there. So, um, yeah. So I hope you all enjoyed the video. Uh, there's obviously a lot of jargon which has been there and there, and uh, we'll hence check up your questions and see what questions you have. Mm. Let us see. So uh, I'll open the chat window here instead. Uh, you can unmute and ask questions yeah. if anybody has questions. Or you can put them in the chat, either of the two. And the important thing is today you have to practice this. Go to those sites, try to download some data and look around because night you'll have a session, uh, right? So you can ask her if you have a specific problem. Yeah, so there's already a question answered, but I'll just do it so that uh, it you know gets you guys to speak. So uh, Priyam asked about this EQJ2000, right? So like Sir has written over there, there's a precession of the axis due to which the RA dex, you all did right ascension declination at an earlier class, but, uh, and we told you that it is constant, right? But it's approximately constant. It, obvious, it does vary for the simple reason that is a precession of the Earth's axis. And therefore, the variation is very small. But for accuracy's sake, uh, for uh, when you do astrometry for astronomical objects, you process your coordinates for a different epoch. But since this is a very small difference, therefore, it's done only every 50 years, right? So you may see J2000, J2050. You guys will see J2050 also. I don't know whether we'll see it, but you guys will see it. And uh, that's it. So what's the purpose of BLAST? Uh, Priyam is asking. So actually what she showed you, see, uh, see one thing you have to realize that, for example, last Saturday when we did TopCat, you saw how do you actually analyze data using the TopCat, uh, you know, tool. But you need to know where to get the data from, right? So all these are different data sources, right, which he's mentioned over there. So it's that everybody houses their different data sources. And for example, uh, BLAST, I'm not too familiar with it, but for example, there was Cosmos. There are other data sets which actually host their data. So we will be having sessions on separate data sets. Like uh, I had mentioned to you all in the first class itself, there is MAST, which is from a multi archive, uh, uh, the, the one from HST, there are different ones. So BLAST is one such data set. You can check it out and see what is there. Uh, Mrinalini is asking uh, me, Oops. 
uh, 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 where will the save file be saved? No, you can save it on your system. You can save it uh, on your system itself. So uh, with IRSA, it's not, but in many of the data places, if you register, like with ESA, European Space Agency, if you register, they give you a certain amount of disk space, which is on their system. And you can, if you want more disk space, you can write to them requesting more. Uh, but in short, the, days is, uh, the file can be saved online as well as offline. Himadri Saha asked, is there a software version of IRSA that can be downloaded and used? See, it doesn't make any sense having a, a downloaded system because the, the software has to constant, constantly interact with the data, right? And um, therefore, in virtual observatory, what was, this, what was uh, thought as the most best system is that you run the software on the servers which actually have the data, right? So that you don't, otherwise what would happen, you'll have to download the software and you will have to download the data and handle that locally, right? Which obviously doesn't make any sense. And therefore what was done is that the servers which house the data, you run the software on those servers and then you retrieve only what you want. So after you do your query, whatever query you want to do, like for example, we also did it with TopCat, with ADQL, uh, astrophysics a query language. You query the server itself at server level and then you get the data and that you get it locally. Once you get the data locally, then you can handle it using your TopCat. You can write Python, you know, Jupyter notebooks. You can do whatever you want. But otherwise, having the IRSA software with you is useless because you'll have to have the data with you, right? And the data is, is very, very large. So it doesn't make sense. Uh, Rohit is asking for observing an infrared wavelength. Does one use infrared filter or do we need a detector? You need both. So Rohit, if you want to observe an infrared, your detector also has to be the kind which is sensitive for infrared. And we also add a, a filter. For example, two mass has JHK filters. So you have uh, the J filters at 1.2 microns. The H filter is 1.65 microns. The K filter is 2.2 microns. Similarly, for Spitzer, you have 3.6, 4.5, etc. So WISE also has its own filters. So your detector also has to be the kind that will take in infrared radiation. And you have to have filters. And that's the biggest problem for infrared detectors because you need to cool your detector, right? And therefore, like, uh, if you remember, uh, uh, Luisa mentioned, for example, Spitzer. Spitzer had cryogen on it to keep it cool. And uh, for a certain period, it ran. But after two years, it ran out of the cryogen. Okay. And then afterwards, uh, the first two filters, which is 3.6, 4.1, 4.5, be continued use. And uh, the Spitzer mission continued as the warm Spitzer. So the warm Spitzer takes only two filters, which are these ones, it cannot take the longer ones because the cryogen was gone. But if you see the older Spitzer data, the one which has four bands or rather five bands, you have a MIPS filter also at 24 microns. So uh, uh, you, you do have that kind. So that is the biggest problem about infrared detectors is the cooling problem that you need to have lots of cryogen also and do it. So that's it. Let's see Akshay. In certain images of Eagle Nebula, the pixels were very big, as shown in the video. Uh, yeah, you are right. The, the pixels were very big because of the point spread function. So depending upon the mission, the kind of resolution of the telescope. For example, WISE. WISE is not a very powerful telescope. So you'll typically see WISE data is very this thing. Similarly, if you were to look at IRAS data, IRAS is a very old satellite. And therefore, the resolution, it had literally 64 pixels on that CCD. And therefore, if you look at IRAS data, the resolution is really bad. And that's another thing you need to worry about later on is that if you want to cross match, right? If you want to cross match, say, X ray data with infrared data, then the point spread function is different for the X ray data and for the um, infrared data. And therefore, when you match it, you will have problems. Okay. So there could be data in, for example, for one source in uh, X ray. You may have many sources in infrared because the resolution problem. So, and, and all of them have an error bar in their position. And the closest match is not always the right match. So it is a little bit of a, a, a complex problem as to how to exactly cross match across 
filters across telescopes because of the errors in resolution. Uh, Vandana is asking, top can be used to answer it. Yes, exactly. So that's what we're trying to build up, Vandana. You are asking whether top can be used to analyze IFSA catalogs? Absolutely. So when you download your IFSA catalog, you should uh, you download it in whatever format. And TopCat takes in a lot of format. There is an IPAC format also. And uh, it, it, uh, TopCat takes that too. Uh, and yes, that's exactly what you need to do. So you need to get the data, say, for example, from the IRSA website. And then you will analyze it using TopCat at the simplest level. And if you want to do much more detailed analysis, then you will write a Jupyter notebook where you will much more um, critically filter out data and analyze it. Right. So that's right. Suman Pramanik asks, atmosphere is not exactly opaque for infrared light. Yes. So uh, you are right, Suman, that the atmosphere is a problem in infrared. In near infrared, that is JHK bands, uh, it kind of, you can observe it from the earth with ground-based telescopes. So the two mass data was used, uh, was made using ground-based telescopes. But if you want to go to longer wavelengths, then the atmosphere is a problem. Right. So one example, for example, you have is uh, Sophia, right? Sophia, like I told you, it's a telescope on an aircraft. And therefore, what it does is it basically goes above the stratosphere. You're going at a higher height and hence you will be able to observe. For telescopes, what is done is you need to have a uh, the observatory at a higher level, right? Higher level above the sea level. So then your amount of atmosphere over there will be much lesser. And basically, this is happening because of water vapor. So you need your, your site to be high as well as dry. So uh, some, some sites are good for infrared, but you cannot go to very long infrared because then that gets blocked by the, um, by the atmosphere. So the answer to your question is either you have a high and dry observatory, right? Or you do Sophia where you take it through an aircraft or even the balloon facility. TIFR ran a balloon facility from Hyderabad itself where they had an infrared telescope on a balloon. And the balloon would take up the telescope, you get the data. And uh, otherwise, you do it with space based. So, space based is IRAS, Spitzer, Herschel, Planck, all these are infrared, far infrared. So, yes, atmosphere is not, uh, there's a problem with atmosphere. Rohit asked if we could start our hands on something simple like knowing the star is active in what wavelength of frequency we can know how to process the images. Okay. So uh, yeah, Rohit, I agree that the, 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 the lecture was probably a little high, but let's, let's try to elevate our levels also, right? If we keep everything very basic, we won't learn much. So let's keep our, uh, what do you say, our aim also a little high. So uh, see, there are many ways in which you can work with this data. For example, if you have the same object, which you have matched with different telescopes, right? You will effectively have a, a, a spectrum, right? And you will have a spectrum. You'll, for example, if it's, uh, we'll talk about that later, but for example, if it's a young star, then there's going to be excess in infrared. If it's a hot star, there'll be excess in the ultraviolet. So as you get the, uh, the flux of the star in different wavelengths, you will actually get the spectrum of the star. And using that spectrum, you can get various parameters for the star. In the sense, you can fit it to a black body and get the temperature. You can look for other uh, emission absorption features, right? So, uh, so uh, for example, so like for example, if the if like I said, if the star is a young star, then it could be active in the infrared wavelengths, and you will see uh, uh, an excess. It is called infrared excess. You'll see excess emission in the infrared wavelengths. So you have to actually search for it. So we'll actually, one of the projects that we'll be doing will be looking for young stellar objects in star forming regions. That's going to be one of the projects that you're going to be doing for which you will need this infrared catalog. So you'll basically look for objects, check them up in their catalogs and see the ones which have an excess of infrared. So simple way of finding excess of infrared is you take, for example, J minus H or H minus K and you see whether that is a larger value. Uh, she also mentioned some infrared excess objects in the in the video, if you remember. Right. So uh, uh, um, Karthik was also says that the, the lecture was good, but too much. So that's why we have you. You have the recording, right? So you can chew on it, open your browsers, try doing the things which she's you know suggested, 
and uh, see what is the thing. Yeah. Uh, I just want to add uh, to what Priya said regarding uh, Himadri's question. He had asked about IR apps, can it be downloaded and used? And like Priya mentioned, uh, these archive, these VO tools which are being developed is to access large amounts of data which are sitting on different catalogs. And having all the data sitting on your system or will be impossible. Right, so many of these aspects which are querying it, they are only these web-based and uh, ones. But there are many uh, VO tools which can be downloaded. Uh, for example, the VO plot and VO stat and other things, and even TopCat, where you can, as was shown by uh, Taylor too, that you can use any other data set your own to do it, right? So probably Madhuri wanted to ask whether if you have other data, not astronomical or some particular data of yours, can it be used? So yes, some of these VO tools can be used to uh, do data analysis and statistical analysis, com compare different tables, which are not necessarily from the net, but some of them have to be uh, bound to the internet. Right, so uh, basically, what we are learn, going to learn is techniques of handling large amounts of data, and obviously, we would want you to do it, use it for astronomical data. That is the purpose of this thing, but but it can be used for other data too, and many of the VO tools which are being developed can be used for other data too, which is sitting on your system or on some other servers other than. Uh, uh, the astronomical data centers. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So, uh, so Rohit as well as uh, Karthik, you basically have to uh, work on that database and uh, you know check things on it. It's, everything is not slow. This thing, but but one thing you need to remember is that this is not rocket science. This is not difficult. It is basically just learning how to maneuver your way through a website, find things which you want, right? If this is, does not involve any equations or anything complicated. You have to just learn how to move around on that website. After that, sometime you'll get so comfortable with the website that you will be able to do things very easily. So what we basically wanted to show you is that these things are available and you can figure out how to handle it, right? There's no, it's, it's not difficult. Uh, Suman, uh, can we have a WhatsApp telegram? We, we already have one. We already have a telegram group, uh, Suman. So uh, I hope you can find it. Okay. Uh, more questions? Come on. Where are the others? You can send a link to link again. Telegram. Yeah, okay. That I'll do that. Uh, somebody can share the link with. Yeah, the telegram, link. the telegram link, please share it. Okay. What are the other questions? Justin is quiet, Gitanjali is quiet. What happened? What source of data is good for analysis? Oh, this is a, a very generic question. It depends on what kind of analysis you're interested in, right? Whether what kind of objects you're trying to study uh, so like like even Luisa works with star formation like me. So then you'll obviously work with infrared data, but you could be depending on the sources you are trying to study, you will use that. So we'll be showing you many data sources in this course. You have to actually start with whatever you want. You, it is up to you decide what would you like to do. One thing is there is that all these are very similar, the websites and all that. So if you, for example, spend your time with IPAC, and later on you realize, oh, I want to use Chandra, for example, right? I'm sure that you will find it easier than to handle the Chandra database also if you've already handled IPAC, right? So you can start uh, going through it. Uh, somebody's gonna share that Telegram link. I, I can't do it, but somebody will share it with you. What source of, okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So Justin and Vitanjali are replying. What about the others? Uh, 
is this a bit too uh, too much was this a bit too much uh, should we be Okay, so Jahang asked me, what about the JM variable? This is the JM is the J magnitude. Okay, the magnitude scales is the astronomical scale to my measure flux, right? And depending upon the filters, we have a nomenclature, right? And the older optical ones was BVRI, but after that, then they continued from I band. You continue it with JHKLM and etc. So what happens is as you're moving away, you're going to longer wavelengths. So J magnitude is 1.25 microns, H magnitude is 1.65 microns. So that is nothing but the brightness in particular filters, right? Uh, Priyam, I have a question. It's a, oh. It, obviously, it, uh, Priyam has a question about special theory, relativity, general theory. Obviously, they are related to astronomy. And uh, can we have a session on it? We can try to do one. Yeah, we can try to organize one. Only that uh, the problem is that this will kind of uh, clash with the theme of our uh, course because we want to work with uh, data, right? So um, we can, I can try to find, uh, we can have a special theory, gen theory talk. That's not a problem, but it will not, uh, it may, I don't think it will involve data. Unless, for example, there's some data with gravitational waves that can be done. We can plan some project with gravitational waves, but otherwise uh, that's a pure theory kind of thing. So it doesn't exactly fall in our course, but we can do that. No problem. Yeah, what we can do is we can arrange some special lectures on different aspects of astronomy from uh, on other days other than these Saturdays and Sundays, because these we will just keep it for that data archival data and how to handle that but if you all interested then on some other days in the evenings or late in the evenings we can have special sessions on various things like relativity cosmology uh, right so we can do that so you can post on the uh, on the telegram and or in the email what all you are looking for, what you expect from this, and we'll see how it can be accommodated. Yeah. Uh, Avik Das Gupta has a good question. Uh, the question is, can you show an example of accessing and analyzing spectrum from IRSA repository for a particular region? That's a good question. It would actually involve cross matching across uh, many filters. And um, I think it's a good question for us to keep for the evening because uh, uh, Luisa, I think, will be able to show you how to do that. I, I, I can do it, but since I've not, I, I mean, I have to, I'll have to try out going back and forth if I try doing it. So I think this is a good question for us to ask Luisa in the evening to actually show an example of doing with the spectrum, right? So by, by analyzing spectrum in this case, what I mean is you will get the brightness of the star in different magnitudes and you will use that to plot it, right? So you will get an individual spectrum for each object. Now there is a VO tool called VO spec. Okay. So in VO spec, for example, you have an object for which you give its brightness in various filters. It actually fits the spectrum and gives you things, right? So uh, this is a good thing to do. And so this is something which can actually be done as a project also of actually, for example, you take a certain region of the sky, for example, some star forming region, because that is best in infrared. Then in that case, you can actually do that to uh, make spectra of the sources which you have in that region, right? So what happens is that uh, we haven't spoken about that, but depending upon the stage in star formation, right? When stars are formed, they go through stages. So the stages are called class one, class two, class three, as they build up to become a star. And all, in all these different stages, the, the kind of infrared behavior you will have will be different depending upon the dust, et cetera, that's there in the protoplanetary disk, right? And therefore, uh, this spectrum can actually be used to characterize those stars. So that can be one of our project topics itself that you take a star forming region, for example, M16 that she was talking about, Eagle Nebula, and actually cross match it across filters, across missions, and uh, use that to actually get the spectrum of objects. 
So once you get the spectrum, you can see that you can actually characterize these objects and see whether they are, um, you know, what kind of objects they are, right? If you can match some of those sources, for example, with Gaia, you can get their distances also. That will add in more to the, the project. So I, soon we'll start formulating our projects and we'll just think. Himadri asked, Bam, in the, in the demonstration, color magnitude diagram. Okay. So we will have some session on what is the HR diagram or the color magnitude diagram. Uh, you, you can go through that. Uh, I've given you all a link to that six day course, which was a basic course, which we did in astronomy. And there, there's a, there's, a, there's a separate lecture on stars and star, form, uh, star evolution, terrible evolution. Please go through that lecture. In that, the HR diagram has been explained in detail. Uh, okay, Gitanjali, we can have a lecture on observation aspect, like talk about filters and all. Okay, yeah, we can have that. Uh, at present, actually, I should tell you all in advance that uh, tomorrow we have the AstroPi session, right? And then from next week onwards, all your Saturdays, all the, there are four Saturdays, which will be done, which will be using radio data by Sushan Konar. She's at uh, National Center for Radio Astrophysics. So your next four Saturdays, will be busy with radio data, basically pulsars. And she will show you all projects and things you can do with pulsars in the radio region, right? On Sundays, uh, on 6 September, we'll be having a talk by one amongst you all, which, who's Rohit. And Rohit basically uses remote telescopes for observations. And uh, so Rohit will give a short talk of 20, 25 minutes on basically showing you how you can actually apply for telescope time on robotic telescopes and observe them. And Rohit actually did that and he presented it at the meeting of the Astronomical Society of India, which was held in Tirupati this Feb, this February. So I thought that would be also interesting for you all to see how can you use robotic telescopes for that. And then the next, the four Sundays in September after the sixth is being done by Timothy Hamilton, uh, Hamilton who's in Iowa. He's going to show you all four different projects in astronomy. Will it be that? So a lot of September is going to be occupied with that. And then October, we'll go back with, uh, we can cover these topics about uh, filters and things like that, right? Uh, till then you can go through things online, but uh, our September is packed. So we'll do that in October. Or we can have uh, midweek sessions in September. You can tell me what you all would prefer if you prefer midweek sessions or we just do it in October, right? So um, that's it. Uh, I would request Sir to actually talk uh, for five, 10 minutes about the Jupyter notebooks because he's taken a lot of effort in correcting the Jupyter notebooks. So uh, you can imagine we can talk about that. Yeah, so yesterday I sat down and I looked into all your Jupyter notebooks and I've Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, there was some net problem, I think. So we got disconnected. Yeah, so as I was saying, most people have done the Python exercise as well. And uh, some have written a separate Python notebook for each problem. So I had to get into each one and do it. 
you can have all the problems in different cells. That's what Ishan showed. Uh, the advantage of Jupyter Notebook is you can have all these uh, independent or even connected cells in one Jupyter Notebook and you can have the whole set. So most people have done it right, but some people have written a different, uh, sent a different uh, notebook for each problem. Yeah, so that becomes cumbersome evaluating. Uh, and some who are used to spider and other things they have run it. So obviously it took an effort to uh, put it in the other environment and run it. So just for uh, going together with everyone, those who are not familiar with Jupyter Notebook, get into that because it will be easier for us to handle uh, all of you. There are a lot of participants, uh, not just uh, who are there with us today, but there are others who see the videos on YouTube later and they are responding and joining in. Yeah, so, and it's a simple thing. The Jupyter Notebook is not very difficult to handle. Uh, tomorrow we'll have a session with Kastub again, uh, Astropy, and what he did last yes, week, last Sunday, just go through it again and uh, come back afresh tomorrow. And... Uh, Third, yeah, we can end. Maybe there's some questions, Natan. Uh, yeah, so okay. Yeah. And Sorry if I... With today's session, uh, you better go to the site which was discussed and practice a little bit, try it out, so that in the night we can um, have question and answer session, which is more meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, there were some questions on YouTube, which uh, I didn't uh, check up. So, uh, there is Priyanka Srivastava asking me, as you mentioned, cross-matching is a problem with different missions. Then if one wants to plot the spectrum for a given star with these different missions, how would that be? So yes, um, like I told you that because of the difference in resolution of different missions, what happens is that the error bars, right? The, the location of the source is within certain errors, okay? So you, for example, you have a certain circle or an eclipse in which the source can exist and you don't know where exactly the source exists. So when you cross match it with another filter, with another mission, for example, the matching may not be, the closest match need not be the right match, right? So often you use other indicates, for example, the brightness of the source. You compare the brightness of both these uh, things which you have, and you try to check which one do you think is the more probable one instead of that. But in short, there are many smart ways of doing that. And there are actually papers written on how to actually cross match across sources, right? It's not a very simple deal. I had done it once for um, Uh, hello. Yeah. So then there's a question by Shishir asking about minor planets. So actually, if you remember, Luisa said, right, because they basically use the wise, uh, the wise data is actually used for minor planets, asteroids, etc., near Earth objects. So it's not exactly my area. I don't know it. So you can, uh, I'm sure there is some tutorial on the website to actually this thing. Otherwise, you can save this question for the evening. Uh, when you talk to Luisa in the evening. Uh, so you can actually, uh, I, I don't know whether you all are aware, but recently there was a thing in the news of these two students from IIT Bombay who actually detected object using uh, data. So um, certain course which they were doing. We are also going to have them with us um, soon. Uh, the dates are not fixed, but we'll have it. 
Priyanka asked me, can this archive program be matured further into the uh, course of time to form a team of interested people headed by conveners where we work on a specific problem aimed for a proper publication? Thank you, but this is actually the purpose. This is actually what we are looking for and that's what we are hoping for. Uh, but like I, uh, but uh, the thing is that uh, uh, the subject is slightly technical. You need to know how to handle data. One thing is to develop a science case. What are you going to study? Number two is how are you going to study that? From where are you going to get that data? Number three is how will you analyze the data that you're going to get? And number four is how will you interpret the analysis of the data that you did, right? And that's exactly what we're trying to teach you in this course. To what, uh, what is exactly uh, being done? And I remember that uh, Gitanjali, I, uh, in the photometry spectroscopy talk, which I gave you all, I did mention some things about filters. So please have a look at that earlier lecture, which was this as part of our course, where we did do some things on filters and things like that. So please have a look at that uh, lecture, right? So that is essential to astronomy two, right? So that's, uh, that's hopefully what we hope to get Priyanka that uh, after we train you all with some amount of basics, that, that we can finally get you all to a stage where you'd actually work on a certain problem. So even the people who have been, uh, have been inviting to talk with us or talk to us, they are also willing to help mentor students who want to do something, right? So if, if one plans off something uh, well enough with uh, Luisa, I'm sure we can plan off uh, something uh, I'm sure she'll be there to help in case we have some questions, right? So yes, that's exactly what we want. We want you all to mature and uh, actually think up projects and things. That's what we'll be doing, I think, by the time we reach October, November. Uh, should we wind up now? Or... So if there are no more questions, we'll wind up for now. We'll wind up for now. And there is lots of work for you to do during the day. Yeah, 10 o'clock in the night, please log in. And uh, just for a general um, advertisement, uh, in Astro Adda also, I'll be talking today at 6 o'clock on some projects with Gaia data. OK, so, uh, so it's 6 o'clock in the evening. What you need to go is go to the Nehru Planetarium, Delhi, YouTube page, and you'll find it on the live feed over there. Okay, so go to Nehru Planetarium Delhi page at six o'clock in the evening today. It's on some projects using Gaia data, right? Yeah. Okay, so I can meet some people in the evening at six o'clock, and most of you all at ten o'clock in the night today, right? So. Thank you and see you, see you in the evening and in the night. Bye-bye.